Hi family and welcome back. It's great to have you back with us to our Word of Christ family. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be glad you're here and you're tuning in to this teaching because it is going to show you something new and fresh about the scripture. This week we're going to be covering what it is to live outside of time. We're continuing on in this book of Galatians and whether you know it, whether you're aware of it or you're not, this is a principle that's well established in scripture. And a few weeks ago, during the 19th teaching on the book of Galatians, we covered the appointed time, which was kind of a first cousin to this. As you know, every week we discuss the summary of what we heard in the teaching. And for that teaching, the last recap point we left with our Word of Christ family was this. It said, do not subject yourself to time. Rather, step into something that has been accomplished. And in discussing this summary point, I made this statement. I said, death is the submission to time. Life is what's experienced when you step out of time. And so when we were in one of our groups, someone in our group turned to me and said, you're just going to drop that grenade in the room and leave it there? Well, here's the good news. This week we're back and we're going to pick up that grenade and we pull the pin out to better understand this principle of living outside of time. It's exciting and it's going to bless you. I encourage you, stay with us at the end. We're going to cover some things about this and really bring this together. Um, Masood does such an amazing job. He's with us this week to go through this. And we have some points to build on it and to leave you with. Um, so you can meditate on this. This one's going to take some time for you to think about and to really grasp um, once this gets planted in your heart. And so stay with us, family, and we'll see you on the other side. God bless you. Hello, family, and welcome back to the study of the book of Galatians. In the last two sessions, we have been looking at uh, the context of bondage and what it means that we were slaves. Jesus showed us in John chapter 8, it was bondage to lies. But that is a general term. It's an umbrella that uh, brings many things under itself. Uh, there are so many things that are lies. And the truth is something completely uh, opposite to that. One of the subjects that is, I think, um, brought so much bondage to all of us, uh, to believers of Christ, uh, is the misunderstanding of what role time plays uh, with respect to uh, who we are now that Christ has come. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. The relation between um, what has been revealed in Christ and the time. Well, Paul shows us something extraordinary about this that at times it's hard to believe because it's so good uh, and unfortunately the natural mind uh, doesn't like things that are extremely good why because it doesn't it's not able to grasp uh, that because it always wants to analyze and it can only predict so much goodness it can't go to um, extreme measures it it can't go to abundance it always is within a limit but now let me quickly read a few verses uh, for you so we can uh, follow uh, together look at verse 8 Galatians chapter 4 verse 8 but then indeed when you did not know God you served those which by nature are not gods but now after you have known God or rather are known by God how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage you see the term bondage uh, is mentioned now let's see what comes after that let's see how they submit themselves to this bondage verse 10 you observe days month and seasons and years i am afraid for you lest i have labored for you in vain okay let me say this paul says i have been laboring for you and i feel like all that i have labored is in vain why because you are again subjecting yourself to 
uh, days, months, seasons, and years. That covers all the spectrum of time. Days, months, seasons, and years. Days make months, months make seasons, and seasons make a year. And Paul says, you are subjecting and submitting to yourself to these things and it shows to us that Paul is saying that you should not that I have been teaching you not to submit yourself to uh, and I'm going to use the term time yeah I'm I have been teaching you not to put yourself under time that's an amazing statement and that's really extraordinary as I said to think of uh, Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit to reveal the mystery of Christ to us that being submitting ourselves to time is absolutely putting ourselves under the bondage for which Jesus Christ came to release or he came to release us, release us from. That by itself, looking at the life of Jesus is clear. He wasn't a man that was subject to time. He wasn't a man that uh, for, you know, uh, the matters of the life in flesh would be waiting for a certain time. He, um, whenever there was a need, whether it was uh, for the body or the soul or the spirit, he just provided it. He, he was never in lack. Um, anytime he... The, people brought um, a problem to him, he provided an answer that was from above, it was not from beneath. For example, in the story of basically people following him in wilderness for three days, they were hungry, and then uh, it says that they came to him and his disciples came to Jesus and they said, you know, let them go. They've been following us for three days. Let them go and to do something for their food so you know uh, they can eat and Jesus said no you feed them and we know the story there are a couple of you know different versions of this uh, that the disciples said well we need at least 200 denarii uh, to be able to make food for them and that was like a year uh, worth of money of their labor so that means they were thinking linearly again that there is a need for money and money comes only at time because in time you're going to make for it. You're going to work for it. But Jesus' answer was completely different. He just did something. Now, how he did it, I don't know. <laughs> Not that I don't know. Obviously, we know it's by uh, the Spirit. It was by the power of God. But he brought something out. He multiplied that which was in the natural so that shows to me that jesus wasn't like oh okay we don't have anything now but we're gonna go you know work get a job uh, make money save money and then we will be one day able to feed the poor or you know feed those who come um, to me he wasn't thinking that way now i know every one of us have been thinking that way and that's unfortunately majority of time that's the way that we think um, um, th that's the way that we think majority of the time but the whole point of this teaching and what you're looking at to be free from this way of life so Jesus wasn't a man that was really operating in time now I know there are certain instances that they came to him and they said uh, certain things and he said my time has not come but it had mostly uh, did with the things that he was showing us because he was revealing a pattern he was talking about the time of his crucifixion because before that he was supposed to uh, declare the name of the father to us he was supposed to uh, make him known to us he was supposed to uh, you know show God's goodness show God's authority and power his willingness the forgiveness of sin his grace his mercy to show that um, he causes his reign uh, to come on the righteous and uh, unrighteous. He was supposed to show all of these things before ultimately show the pattern of life, which was dead to the self and risen in Christ.
So that's why that term, my time has not come a lot of time you see. But apart from that, when it comes to life in the flesh, he was completely living a different life. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this, I'm going to show you. <clears throat> uh, in God consciousness, time is subject to spoken words. I'm going to say it again. In God consciousness, time is subject to spoken words. Now, once again, I have to remind all of us that Paul just told us, why do you submit your time, basically yourself, to time? Why do you subject yourself to days, months, seasons, and years? In general, why do you subject yourself to time? And I just said... Um, that in God consciousness, time is subject to spoken words. This is actually in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to see that. Uh, well, let's see it now and we can come back. Because I wanted to show you how Hebrews uh, 11 and Galatians both have a term that connects the two chapters together. Um, but you know we can always come back look at uh, John uh, sorry Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen for by it the elders obtained a good testimony verse 3 by faith we understand that the world's Okay, let me make a correction here. Uh, this is not the word worlds in the Greek. This is the word age. Okay, he says, by faith, we understand that the ages were framed, confined, put in a boundary, defined in basically a borderline. Uh, once again, by faith, we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God, the spoken word of God, the rhema of God. Okay. By faith we understand that the ages were framed by the spoken word of God. The ages, okay, by the word of God, not the word of God by the ages. Okay. God's word doesn't come by ages. It's not like there is an age and then there is a second age and then there, there is a third age and then a word from the Lord comes. No, the word of the Lord has set these ages in order. By the word, by the spoken word of the Lord, the ages were framed. Okay, now that's about God. But Paul says, well, the thing is now you are one with him. Okay. Now, once you were under a tutor, Galatians chapter 3 told us, but after faith has come, you're no longer under a tutor. Now, by faith, we understand that the time is framed by the spoken word of God. I just replaced ages by uh, the word time. By faith, we understand that the, the time is framed by the spoken word of God. So that means in order to wait for a time, you have to create that time. Let me say it in, in a different uh, way. In order to see... <clears throat> okay, let me back up again. Galatians chapter 4 is all about you being the heir. Okay, we, we, we talked about this as uh, going from being a child to a son to an heir that actually inherits. And it showed us um, you can be under a bondage and be a child, or you can come out of bondage and be a son and inherit. So we said that that bondage was the lies, and one of those lies is to actually uh, think that we are subject to time, that uh, if I wait just for the next year, the Lord will do this. Or in five years, the Lord will do this. Or in 
you know uh, when i get to my 40s the lord will do this um, those are the old covenant type of words of prophecies the new covenant is all about now okay we talked about this the appointed time the fullness of time and god sent his son to release us from the bondage the bondage was the bondage of the lies of which one is that we are bound to time we're not we are not in bondage to time god has not subjected us to time he has subjected all things to his sons okay even times so that's why you can see jesus doing the things that were out of time he was doing things that were you know different he wasn't a or he wasn't an ordinary man he was an ordinary man in a sense that he was like all of us he had the same flesh the same blood he was like us having you know living the same earth living uh, eating the same food and all of that but what was inside of him that realization that came to him in the day that he came out of water baptism by the way i've been talking about all of this in the previous lessons baptism to christ so likewise for us that baptism he went through we are we, we have been going through baptism to christ so the day that he came out of water what happened a spirit came upon him and a word basically a word was said which is this is my son in whom i am well pleased and then the spirit was uh, came upon him the spirit of the lord came upon him now he also heard that i'm the son then that word was tested for 40 days by several doubts that were risen in his mind that all started with this one sentence which is if you are the son of god so he went through all those temptations he overcame them and guess what he came out the bible says with spirit and power which spirit that spirit of the lord that came upon him in luke chapter 4 after that he goes to a synagogue he is handed over the scroll of isaiah he opens it he finds the place that it was written uh, what he wanted to read and he read it which started by this the spirit of the lord is upon me okay and then he began to say what he was about to do with the spirit of the lord that was upon him to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted to set the captives free to proclaim the acceptable uh, day of the lord the appointed time where all debts are paid out where uh, freedom is declared to all the land which people everyone can return to the land of their inheritance by the way this is in levi it's about the day of uh the year of jubilee uh, there are so many connections i can go and um, teach that now but you can look it up i think it's in uh, levi chapter 26 the day that actually you're released pro the liberty is proclaimed which is by the way the word forgiveness of sin uh, that all that you were under bondage of is gone and you can return to the land of your inheritance and to possess it okay so <clears throat> jesus said the spirit of the lord is upon me now you and i have the spirit of the lord upon us to do what to do what he did the spirit of the lord comes upon you because he's about to break every yoke of bondage isaiah says um the, the anointing will break the yoke okay watch which anointing the spirit the holy spirit that is upon us the spirit of the lord will break everything that was fleshly taught that brought us to bondage now uh once again i'm going to say this and i'm going to show you something more in the old testament scriptures uh i said in god consciousness time is subject to a spoken words so you change things by your words not in time okay because if you subject yourself to time time is all about decay 
nothing actually gets better in time. If you know, eventually things, yes, maybe grow, but eventually they go down. Uh, everything that man has made uh, will decay in time. You buy iPhone and four years later, suddenly its battery won't hold up anymore. Uh, you know, the glass is broken, uh, the speaker is not as loud anymore. You, uh, you pick up a food and you put it, you know, even in the fridge, and after a month you see that it's spoiled. Uh, even human beings, the, the flesh, you see that yes, the baby is born, grows up, uh, is flourishing, but at a certain time you see the decay. So this is because we have subjected ourselves to, to time. Okay, now God's consciousness through the spirit of the Son that has been sent into our hearts is convincing us to come out of this bondage and believe that we can change things instead of being changed. Okay? We can change things. And honestly, everything that Jesus did, okay, it was by a word that he spoke. He never labored for anything. His words were words of authority and power. It says people marveled at this, uh, what they were witnessing. They said, even with a word, he commands unclean spirits to come out. With a word, he uh, quieted or uh, put to silence the waves of the sea. With a word, he raised the dead. Lazarus come forth. Everything was done by a word. And this is who God is. You know, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning also, God said. Everything that you see in the book of Genesis chapter 1, it was done by a word. God said and it was. So now, if we are made in his image and in his likeness, that means we are to be the time uh, definers. We are to be the time setters, not to be under time. Okay? We must define what it is. Now, uh, let me give you something. So actually, you have more faith uh, into God's word. Let's go to Isaiah. Hopefully, I can find it. Isaiah chapter 51, I think. Yes, 51. Uh, now, this speaks to you. You are the just that is living by faith. We've covered this in the book of Galatians already. You are the righteous. Okay? Uh, you, you believed. You didn't work for it. Your righteousness is not of uh, works, but it's of faith. Now, look at 51 of Isaiah. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. So it's speaking to you, speaking to me. You who seek the Lord, okay, look to the rock from which you were hewn. So he's saying us, you know what? You have an origin. You have a birthing place. And who made you? It's him. Okay, it's God who has made us. Now, that's the beginning of it. Let me take you almost to the end because that's my whole point. I brought you here to talk to you about the words. Look at, <clears throat> uh, look at verse 15. It says, But I am the Lord your God who divided the sea whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And listen, I have put my words in your mouth. Once again, I have put my words in your mouth. Not I have put your words in your mouth. I have put my words in your mouth. That's why we have to see as long as we are doing the will of God, which is life, the words that are in our mouth, it's not ours, it's his. And if it's his word, well, it shall accomplish. This is Isaiah 55. It shall accomplish. He said, my words shall not return to me void. When it proceeds out of my mouth, it shall accomplish. It shall prosper 
in the things that he was sent for. Okay, so he says now, you who seek after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, because I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. That's the spirit of the Lord. Basically saying, listen to me, the spirit of the Lord is upon you, and the word of the Lord is in your mouth. So why to go that far? Why God is giving us both his spirit and his word for one reason. That I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. This is so beautiful. This is these people, the Zion people, they are the people of the new heaven and new earth. And who are they? The new creation. And God says this experience of new man or new creation is not going to be something magical that you say, okay, Lord Jesus, I believe in you and now you are a new creation. It's true because he has seen you that way always, but to come to, ex to experience it, to become it, okay? There is a need for the spirit of the Lord to be upon you, the shadow of his hands and his word in your mouth to speak it. So <clears throat> never be idle in terms of not speaking that which the, word, the, the Lord has put in your mouth. And what is that? I mean, I don't need to go there. Romans chapter 10 tells us that uh, this word, uh, Moses he says Moses even showed this to us. He said, you know what? This righteousness of uh, uh, works, yes, you have the law, do them, and you will live by them. But the righteousness that is, and um, he, basically, and then he goes on to say, but the righteousness that is of faith doesn't speak this way. He's not about, you know, he doesn't say who shall ascend into he heaven or who shall descend into abyss. He says, by the way, that thought was to bring Christ down from heaven and bring Christ up from the realm of the dead. He says, but this word suddenly changes Christ to word. This word is in your heart and in your mouth to speak it. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, you who seek after righteousness, and with the mouth the salvation which you desire will be experienced. Okay, so it's the faith in the heart that I believe that I am the Christ, the anointed of God, that I am one with the Lord Jesus Christ, that I am made in the same exact likeness and image. That faith gives me a righteousness that makes me bold to use my tongue also. And it says your tongue will save you. Just as it put you in trouble in the first place, now it shall become the same place that salvation comes from. So, in God consciousness, time is subject to spoken words. Speak God's word. Speak God's word. Now, I'm not about, you know, uh, just confession and all those things that the old way, but there is truth also to that, because if you truly do it out of the heart, you know, you may be completely in the flesh, you may be completely not thinking God or not thinking Christ or not thinking the Spirit, you're just in flesh, let's be honest, you're, you're, you're uh, entangled with the affairs of life, you are uh, fixed and focused on struggles and problems, you have worries and stuff like that. But even in the midst of that, just beginning to say some words, it just changes everything. The other way, uh, Rose and I were in the train, um, um, going to the airport, and um, uh, one of the good things about Facebook is that it brings up your um, posts from the previous years. So there was a post that came up um, that actually became the inspiration for this teaching also. Uh, and I read it, um, and 
I began to talk to Rose about, about it. And within a matter of, I think, two minutes, uh, I was so loud in the train speaking about this. Why? Because there was so much, you know, um, excitement and life and joy that it automatically basically brought the level of my voice up. It, it was so freeing, it was so enjoying. I didn't care anymore about where I am or what's happening around me. So what I'm trying to say is um, the word that you speak has effect on you. Okay? Just as negative words have negative impacts, positive words have positive impact. Now, we are not about positive thinking and positive you know, um, speaking and stuff like that. You're talking about the word of the Lord. Okay? Think about this. This same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is called the spirit of the Lord. And you can say the spirit of the Lord is upon me. What a powerful awareness to have. And what a powerful awareness to know that the words that are in my mouth are the word of the Lord. Speak to your problems as God. Don't, God, don't talk to God. I, I know it's cliche, but it's true. Don't talk to God about your problems. It's good. Sometimes do it. When you're really, you know, there's no strength, nothing, talk to him like David did many times so that you can bring, you know, all the false beliefs out and then you feel released and then, you know, grow from that place. But pay more attention to what you can speak uh, from a place of authority rather than to being under a certain bondage. Speak to your problem. The things that you want to be changed, you speak to them and don't think about time in terms of times. Because if it's God's spirit and God's word, do you think he cares about time? Do you think God is limited to time? No. So likewise, just meditate on this one sentence again, and I think that would sum up this session that in God consciousness time is subject to spoken words so how important therefore spoken words become okay if God set the ages or framed the ages the time by his word shall we not shall we not live the same way well Paul says yes he says, in fact, I've labored, I have so much labor to bring this awareness to you, people of Galatia, that you may live this way, that you may not subject yourself to bondage of time anymore. Okay? Um, please meditate on this. And let's all of us together um, become an encouragement to each other uh, that we may not be victims of anything in this world, but we may become the overcomers in this world and bring glory to the Father who has covered us with the shadow of his hand and he has put his word in our mouth. Let's not use it in vain, but bring it to fulfillment. Bless you. I'll see you in the next week's uh, teaching. Okay, family, welcome back. I told you this one was going to be fun, and it was. What an amazing teaching on what it is to live outside of time. And so we're excited to, to, um, to round this out and to bring this together and summarize this for you um, so you can meditate on this. You're going to have to come back to this and bring yourself back into this teaching um, so you can think about it and let it become a reality for you. And so the first point is this, is that the scripture admonishes against believers being in bondage to time. And so this isn't something that you hear a lot about in churches, but here we go. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, we read, and it said this, After you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and season and years. 
I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Okay, so let's break this down. What does the apostle mean when he says, I labored for you in vain? We read it a little bit later in verse 19. He says, when he says this, he goes, I labor in birth until Christ is formed in you. He's working and working focusing on bringing the church, the body of Christ, to the point of maturity where the full image of Christ is formed in each of us. And he calls the observation of time, days, months, season, and years. He called that mindset, he calls it weak. And he said, why do you want to be in bondage to that? He's making a point that our source of life should be rooted and centered in something that is not limited to the constraints of time. And he says to the church, I'm afraid for you that you're missing the very essence of faith in God. Have I done all this for nothing? Have I labored in vain? We'll recap more about what this means, but the point here is that in this, you can see that the scripture admonishes against believers being in bondage to time. Okay, the second point is this, is that decay is the natural res- the natural result of time. And I'm going to get a little bit sciencey here with you. Um, and so I want you to stay with me as I kind of break this down. And so the British mathematician, Lord Kelvin, established in 1851 that this science in the second law of thermodynamics. He noted this. He said this. We find that, that the most probable state for any natural system is one of disorder. Listen, all natural systems degenerate when left to themselves. This is the scientific principle known as the arrow of time. The arrow of time establishes that as one goes forward in time, the entropy of an isolated system will only increase. What is entropy? Entropy is a scientific scientific definition as well as a measurable physical property that is associated with a state of disorder, randomness, or uncertainty. And this scientific law that we call the arrow of time establishes that any isolated system, which is a system with only itself as a source of energy or life, will, with certainty, decay across time. And you see this arrow of time in full effect in every natural physical element of this world. Buildings that are left abandoned will just decay over time, all by themselves, without you having to apply any force to it, they just start to wither. Every homeowner knows the amount of energy, literal energy, that you have to apply in order to keep your house from decaying or going into disorder. And even in our natural body, you know, at the age of 25, your body stops producing collagen. At the age of 30, your muscles start to slowly move into atrophy. And so it's evident that the constraints of time and the decay of time is a property, it's a system that is bound in this natural world. Without an an external source of life, without an external source of energy, decay is the natural result of time. And this is the thing that in Galatians, the scripture calls living this way, calls it out as bondage. I hope that helped you understand this a little bit better. The third point is this, is that in God consciousness, time is subject to the spoken word. Okay, this is powerful. What is God consciousness? You heard Masood say it several times throughout the teaching, and we're calling it out here again. God consciousness is when our heart, our soul, and our mind, our full state of being is more in tune to the reality of the spirit than when our heart, soul, and mind is tuned into the elements of this physical world. That's what God consciousness means. And when we're in that state, when we are more aware of the conscious of God, when we are than we are of our circumstances and the factors of this world, then time and all the effects of time become subject to the spoken word because we're working off a different reality. 
And what do we mean when we say that time is subject to the spoken word? It means that we are fully aware, we're conscious to the fact, to the truth, that we can change things, not by what we do, but with our words. So instead of laboring under this arrow of time, we can speak things into existence. Consider that everything that Jesus did, he did by his spoken word. You can look through it. He didn't have to labor for anything. His word his words were words of authority and power. It's clear that his words came from a spiritual dimension that was not constrained by the system in this world. Jesus was not in bondage to time. And this is who we were created to be. The very center point of our faith requires the transcendence of time. Our faith pulls us out of the linear dimension of time, out of the arrow of time, and it says, in God, all things are now. In God consciousness, time is subject to the spoken word. Okay, my fourth and final point is this. Our words are not carnal. They are the Lord's. I know we're throwing a lot of things at you this week, but you got to hang with us uh, as we go through this. We've been on this journey of understanding what it means to be baptized into Christ, what it means to be put on Christ, what it means to put on Christ. This was Galatians 3.27, where we come to recognize that we are heirs of a great inheritance. And from heirs, we are see that we step into sonship. Right? We saw bondage for what it is when we were talking about it the past couple of weeks in believing a lie to learning to live with an approved mind where we measure everything against the truth of God's word. All of that brings us to this recognition that when we take on God's consciousness, which is the mind of Christ, our words are not our own. But we begin to speak life and our words are God's words. We explicitly read this in Isaiah 51, verse 15 and 16, where it said, I am the Lord your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared, and I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered with you with the shadow of my hand, that I might plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. We have talked about how we, as God's children, we literally get to participate in the creation process. We're not creating the heavens or the fish or the birds, but with our words, we form the kingdom of heaven here on earth, just as Jesus did, instantly and in the now. And this happens outside of the time of labor. In this world system, we have to work. We have to create the time and the results we need are subject to the constraints of time. In the kingdom of heaven, our words are his words and produce the same life in virtue that his words produce. Our words are not carnal. They are the Lord's. Okay, family, that's a lot to take in and that's a lot to meditate on it. And I hope you're as excited about this as I am. Here, I, I want you to, uh, I want you to, I want to leave you with this one thing um, that I came across that speaks to this. Our goal here was to introduce you to the truth that as believers, we live. We have the ability to live outside of time. You're going to have to let the Holy Spirit bring this home for you. But here's what I want to leave you with. In 2016, the oldest and leading scientific journal on, on physics posted a paper with this conclusion. This is the same scientific journal that published all of Einstein's finding. And it said this, in physics, past, present, and future are all the same thing. But to you and I and everyone else, time only moves in one direction, from expectation, through experience, and into memory. This Linearity is called the arrow of time. And here's the thing. It only progresses that way because as humans, we exist to observe its pathing. It's not necessary and it's not part of physics itself. But the arrow of time and all the decay that sits within the arrow of time progresses the way it does because 
We as humans exist to observe its passing. Okay, you can think on that for a little while. But here, here's my message to our family. Go for it. Now faith is, see the kingdom of God not as some far distant in the future hope, but in today, it is our very present reality today and now. All right, family, I hope that blesses you and I hope the spirit of God lights this up inside of your heart, at least generates enough interest for you to pursue this and for you to dig and understand and talk about what this means, what life in the now, what life outside of time means for us as a body. All right, stay with us. We continue on on the book of Galatians next week. So good to have you with us, enjoying the goodness of the truth of the word of God. We'll see you then.